So for those of us who haven't joined us before, my name is uh, Dr. Esther Mim Wagner. I'm the executive director of the Wolf Institute. Uh, the Wolf Institute is located in Cambridge and it uh, focuses on relations between uh, religion and society. With us today, we have some of the Wolf Institute's brightest minds. Uh, we have Alisa Simon, who's a Wolf PhD scholar and also the Jewish co-chaplain here at the University of Cambridge. And we also have Ahmed Zaidi, who's just completed his PhD uh, in Cambridge on computer science. Uh, and he is a, a, a very uh, important member of our, the Wolf Institute's uh, Development Council. So welcome, Alisa and Ahmed, to this session. Um, in the episode today, we want to discuss humor and religion, and uh, we want to approach it from various perspectives. So first, we want to talk a little bit about the function of humor in general and the function uh, uh, of humor in religious communities in particular. And then secondly, we want to talk about audiences and about performers. Uh, and lastly, we want to talk about uh, humor with religious themes or on religious figures. We'll watch a few clips during this uh, webinar and uh, our panel members, uh, including myself, will discuss some of the themes that are being raised uh, in these segments. And uh, as usual, we'll leave some time for question and answers in the end. And you can type in your questions into the Q&A box that is at the, at the bottom of your screen. So to the first point, the function of humor in general, humor is very often used to make light of difficult, difficult and, and stressful situations. And, this brings me, of course, to the day today. Today is uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. And uh, when we were originally discussing or rescheduling this webinar, uh, we had a few dates and we were wondering whether it's actually appropriate to do a webinar on humor on Holocaust Memorial Day. And uh, we thought about the various approaches to the Holocaust through humor. For example, if you think of Life is Beautiful or Georgia Rabbit, like one of the recent movies, uh, on the Holocaust that took a humorous approach. It's really clear that humor has always been a, a part of the Holocaust memorial landscape. And uh, it also has been sort of an important part of public engagement with the Holocaust. Is that right, Alisa? Yeah, I think I think that's very, that's very correct. And I think that um, part of what the Jewish community does on Holocaust Memorial Day is obviously we talk about um, the tragedy of the Holocaust and, and what it's done to our communities. But a lot of the way that we talk about it and approach it is through is through the cultural life that these communities have. And a lot of that is about Jewish humor. So I think that um, really one very important way to commemorate those communities and their lives and not only think about uh, the death of the Holocaust, but also that it that it brought in, but also think about the lives that these communities had. A lot of it is embedded in humor. So I actually think this is very appropriate uh, for today. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so humor is really a day, uh, it's really a way to, to deal with injustice, to stick it to people in power, to overcome one's own inferiority. And uh, I always thought that humor with self-deprecation is really a very powerful tool for people. And for me, it's one of the, the most appealing uh, human qualities. And hence, it's also been a really essential part of many of, uh, of the persecuted minorities in the world, um, Jewish humor was very famous and uh, 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 important part of Jewish culture. How is this in, in Muslim communities, Ahmed? That's a really good question. I think um, as the years go by, I feel that you are seeing more um, Muslim humor in, uh -huh. in society, primarily because Muslims are going through a period in history where they feel very um, persecuted and feel like they're very marginalized in societies. And in these scenarios, um, you're seeing more Muslim comics come up, talk about Muslim struggle. And I think it's, it's very critical. Um, you know, there's, I think the importance of humor, if you take a scientific approach, humor releases endorphins and endorphins releases, reduces your pain and stress. And that ultimately allows you to relax a bit and connect with the individual who's, who's talking about the jokes. And I think in a situation where tensions are often high, especially in marginalized groups, humor serves as a really good way to sort of break that barrier and connect with the, the other community. And I think it's so important for communities to use humor as a tool to connect with one another and to build bridges with one another. Um, and, you know, as we'll see later today, there, there is a rise of Muslim comics. And I think it's, it's great that there is because it, it really allows us to talk about sometimes often very touchy topics. You know, on the one hand, you will see in the video, and we can talk about it later, but on the one hand, topics that might feel 
very taboo and very you know sensitive can be portrayed in a humor in, in, a, in a comedic sense and that allows people to approach it and digest it in a very different way that creates a discourse that I think is quite productive. Alisa, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a very what Ahmed brought up was a very interesting point that I, I had never considered that it's a way uh, of release. I think um, humor is also a way to create a culture. It's a way to shape discourse, and I think that that is another thing that um, is happening uh, both in the Muslim world and in the Jewish world, where different parts are trying to to shape a narrative, um, and humor is a very good tool. Um, for that, um, if we're talking about belief in God, if we're talking about religion, um, if you laugh or if you make satire out of something, um, you can you can essentially really influence how society views it. And I think that that is another thing that we're seeing, uh, both in Muslim communities that are struggling with certain narratives that exist uh, in their arena, and you can also see it in Jewish communities as well. Um, I suggested that we watch a certain clip. Um, so Lisa, I hope you can get the clip going for the audience to see. Mm -hmm. The lamp wasn't there before. <laughs> the lamp, bro, that's the one. And they changed the paint still. Have you two been in here before? <laughs> <laughs> what is the purpose of your visit to Marrakesh? Basically, one of our boys is getting married and we're going to Marrakesh to do his stag do, but obviously we keep it halal. Hashtag halal, bro. Can you both please remove your shoes? Already, Already done, done it. it. Not just shoes, come bro. On, come on, come on. It's not just that, is it? Laptops, oh. belts, phones. Oh, chewing gum. Oh yeah, of course, chewing gum, bro. Have you ever had any trouble with the police? I'm already buying it, bruv. What's your name? Toby. Toby, do me a favor, yeah? Um, when you say that, just say it with a bit more aggression so we get a little bit scared, you know what I mean? Yeah, like with good posture and that. Have you ever had any trouble with the police? That yes! Was good, that like that! Mm -hmm. Like, uh, do you have suspicious items in your bag? Do you have any links with terrorism? Do you know how to make a bomb? Do you know ISIS? Bruv, to save you some time, I got a PDF copy with all the answers on my phone. I can just send it to you right now if you want. Or I got a printed copy. Which, Which one, one do you want? want? Uh, I, I don't know. Take, take both, both, bro. Take, take both. Here you go. Here you go, bro. Take, take it. Take it. Smart He's good, man. He's, He's good. a nice He'll guy. He'll go far. He'll go far. He's <sighs> right. I mean, this all checks out. You're, you're free to go. Hey. Oh. Uh, I do apologise though, but you have actually missed your two o'clock flight. Ah, oh, Toby. Why are you apologising to us for, man? Our flight is at two o'clock tomorrow, not today, silly. Tomorrow. Why did you check in for your flight twenty-four hours early? Bruv, bruv, come on, mate. Come on, bruv. Obs. See this? Bruv. Obviously, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah. Not a tan, my friend. Nice yeah. one. Uh, we'll send you the next brown, boys, yeah? Yeah, please do. Uh, I, I mean, if you want to. Uh, I, I didn't say brown. He said it. So this uh, clearly demonstrates the points that uh, I made earlier. Difficult, you make light of difficult and, uh, and, and stressful situations. Do you have any comments on this, Ahmed? I mean, uh, I mean, going back to my earlier point, I think it, it very much allows you to talk about interrogation and racial profiling in a way that is less intense. Um, you know, we could have a conversation about racial profiling. I've actually been racial profiled. I had a very similar story. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I could talk about that story in a very comedic sense, which would allow people to relate to it and maybe even ask questions around, oh, right. How did, like, you know, how do we solve this problem? Whereas if I talked about it in a very serious way, in an accusatory way, or in a, and that's completely justified as well, it would be difficult to build that bridge, especially let's say, for example, you were talking to somebody who was not Muslim and you're trying to explain to them about the Muslim struggle or about being racially profiled because you're Muslim and bringing that topic up if they don't relate to it if they can't understand it then they might feel a little bit uncomfortable to you know dissect the situation a bit further or have discourse around it on the other hand if you put it into a comedic skit as as these guys have done uh one it's it's funny and allows you to connect with these two individuals uh and two 
it allows you to sort of talk about it in an intellectualized way and in a way more open than you would if you were talking about it in a very serious way. Lisa? Yeah, um, I agree with everything that uh, Ahmed said. I also think that it reverses the joke. So if usually in these situations, um, unfortunately, like the airport officers feel that it's okay to make a joke on ground, like just the way that they treat minorities is, is it's like, oh, look, we're stopping them at the border. And sometimes you can feel as if like the, the, the minority is the one that is being played the joke on, right? They're all so very, I, I agree with uh, Ahmed that it's, that it, it enables us to talk about criticism, but it's also a tool to reverse who is the marginalized group, who is the one that is being prosecuted right now. And through humor, we can, we can reverse those roles, um, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really valid point. I actually was reading an article about this and it talks about, should we stop making jokes about religion? Should we stop making jokes about race? Uh, and the argument in this, in artic this article the premise is based on the fact that the minorities are the butt of the joke. But as um, Alyssa just pointed out right now, uh, it's in a very creative way. The butt of the joke is actually the officer in the scenario, which isn't a minority. So uh, I think that's a very good point. And that might go into the nuance of humor in general and you know what sort of is considered acceptable and what isn't. I think in this scenario, because, because the, like as Alyssa said, you're flipping the joke on itself, you flip it. Yeah, the minority groups are, you know, it's suddenly the ones making fun of the majority. It seems acceptable. It seems appropriate. Um, but if the joke is targeted towards the minority or the minority is about the joke, then then there's a little bit more nuance and depth that you have to go into it to sort of figure out what is considered acceptable. And I think different religious groups have different uh, like acceptability uh, boundaries around humor in that sense. Mm. And of course, this, this subversion, this flipping of um, sort of, of power is also what, what is the big threat about humor, right? I mean, the threat that um, makes people, for example, arrest someone in India for making anti-Hindu jokes or um, under the Nazi regime, people were, who were making fun of uh, out of sort of Nazi um, bonds as being, uh, being arrested. Or in Russia, uh, people, you know, sort of humor or sort of satire really seen as a, as a, as a, as a force that was completely sort of dissecting the state. Um, let's move on to a discussion of audience and performers now. Um, we have actually chosen a little segment that's taken from the show, The Two Ronnies, which is a British uh, television comedy that was created by Bill Cotton and it aired between 1971 and 1987. And it features the two Ronnies, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett. Um, and they're usually all sorts of sketches. And this sketch is, has actually a religious theme. Um, Alisa, if you can start the, the clip. Just, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I want to insure myself against becoming Jewish. A maximum cover, not too high a premium if possible. Uh, yes, but well, I think you better take a seat. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Are you comfortable? Oh, I'll get by, I'll get by. <laughs> While what you suggest is perfectly reasonable in every way, um, we as the insurers have to satisfy ourselves, you see, that the chance of you becoming Jewish um, uh, is, is minimized as far as possible, do you understand? You mean you think I'm already Jewish? No, 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 no. You think I'm Jewish already? No, 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 no. <laughs> If you think I'm Jewish, just come right out and say so. I think you're Jewish. <laughs> Little note of levity. However, I will have to take down uh, some details, obviously, for the sake of... Uh, uh, now, could I, uh, could I have your name, please? It's Abrahams. <laughs> Abrahams, yes. Now, and your address? Uh, 35 for Mitzvah Garden. <laughs> More. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Abrahams, I... No, no, please, please, call me Reuben. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, well, Robin, I... Uh, Reuben, Reuben. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Reuben. Reuben. Um, while I personally 
I don't doubt your sincerity in any way at all. I mean, I really mean that. I, I can't, of course, answer, do you see, for my superiors. Oh, superior schmooperior. <laughs> tell you what to do. Now look, that is the sort of thing that may very well arouse suspicions. That Jewish expression. Look, I can't help my face, can I? <laughs> I can't do about my own face. I can't do anything about my own face. Look, why don't you accept the word of a man when he says he's not Jewish? Look, you look at me, look at me. I'm miserable. I'm miserable. Jewish people have a wonderful sense of humour. They're funny. Look at Max Bygrave. <laughs> My grave is not Jewish. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> On my life, I'm Gentile. Please, I'm as good as they come. Look, I, I must ask you to leave the office. Oh, I really can... what a machuganella. Please, would you mind, do me a favour, just reconsider my offer, would you please? Look, you don't seem to understand, Mr. Abrams, the very principle of insurance is that you, the client, pay we, the insurers, large sums of money. Yes? Yes, that is it. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is insurance, you see. Now, were you to ask me to insure you against becoming a Catholic? A Catholic? What do you take me for? What do you take me for? <laughs> I should want the policy against sudden conversion to Catholicism. You must think I'm bombing. One pound a month. Oh, one pound a month, I'll take it. <laughs> Look, could you insure my friend Jaime as well? I, against becoming a Catholic, sir? Oh, that's wonderful. He's outside. I'll oh. just go and get him. It won't take a moment. Thank you. Uh, Jaime, Jaime, the man says he will insure you against becoming a Catholic. I told you I'll get you a good deal. Come on in, come on in. This is my friend Jaime Borgia. <laughs> Who's been fighting? Again, like with, with many um, sketches and uh, sort of humorous uh, uh, films from, from, from past decades, it's often quite difficult for us to sort of digest it with our modern minds. Um, Alisa, you are Jewish. What do you feel when you watch a skit like this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, many things come up. For me, the most intriguing um, thought was why would somebody want to insure himself against becoming Jewish, <laughs> right? Like, wh what, what is this clip about? Obviously it's about insurance and capitalism and converting from one's religion or not, but they picked the Jewish religion. And obviously it's bringing with it, and I think this is also something that we, we opened this episode with, right? Holocaust Memorial Day. Like, there is a very hard history of, of what being, being Jewish entails, what, what that can, what you can carry as a Jew, and, and, and maybe ensuring yourself against being perceived by society as someone who could one day become Jewish. Um, it's a way to laugh about, about, about a history that has been quite hard. Uh, for the Jewish people, I think that's the first thing that um, comes to mind when I when I watch this clip. Why why does the Jew want to be uh, insured? Um, and the other thing, obviously, there is the, the Jewish face, right? The Jewish characteristics that are portrayed. Jewish humor. I'm not funny, right? I'm as serious as I'm miserable, <laughs> um, which is obviously be looking miserable is also a Jewish characteristic. I think I think there's a lot of um, like a discussion about what stigma is and how is stigma perceived, both by those that are from within the religion, by the Jew in this, in this clip, and also by the person who is uh, not willing to sell him that insurance. What is the stigma of the Jew, and how does that stigma change between um, the different perspectives? And I think that, again, these are very serious conversations about, about uh, Jewish security, Jews feeling security in a secular state, um, what the stigma is of a Jew, both for the, the person within the community and for both for the person who's external to the community. And humor enables us to touch these really contentious topics um, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do so had we not had this blanket of, of just ha 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 over, over everything. So that, that, those are the thoughts that, um, that I had when I was watching this clip. And quite a few of these issues also arise, of course, from, from non-Jewish people impersonating Jewish people. Ahmed, what do you think generally, if someone in a skit plays a non-Muslim plays a Muslim, what, what reaction does that cause in you? I thought about that. And um, see, the thing is, it depends on the joke. Um, and, and this is just my take on it. And I feel like if the joke is, if the joke is something that's, that's relatable by Muslims in general, then, and it's a good impersonation, then I wouldn't mind, I think. But if it's a bad impersonation and it's the joke isn't necessarily 
targeting stereotypes that are true, but rather are just, you know, misconstrued, misunderstood situations. So I'll give you an example. You know, if you have those jokes about Muslim wearing turbans, like Muslims don't wear turbans. Like, yeah, there, there are some that do, but most of them don't. And that's not like a stereotypical image of a Muslim, but there are a lot of jokes about turbans. And I never understood that. Um, and I don't find that funny. And, and in, in a sense that that would be considered either dumb or like at, at, at the least dumb at the most, maybe a bit offensive because it's perpetuating stereotype doesn't exist. Well, on the other hand, if the joke was about something that is actually something that, you know, very, it's very Muslim or it is very something that Muslims could relate to, you know, as something as trivial as, oh, right. Like pretending, like, like almost teasing yourself to drink water in Ramadan when you're fasting or something like, you know, trying to marry outside of your Muslim circle or group or whatever. Those things are very related, re relatable and something that I feel are important topics. I mean, the latter is definitely an important topic to discuss. And if that was portrayed by somebody who wasn't a Muslim, but in a very accurate sense, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem with it. But I can imagine that other people might have a problem with it. Humor is one of those things that I feel is a very, uh, here, let me tell you about my situation. And that's why I'm, I'm making fun of my own situation or I'm, I'm flipping my own situation on its head. So I'm telling you about my own situation and you should listen and here's how you can understand me. Whereas if you start feeling like someone else is making fun of your situation, then suddenly it's not so funny anymore, right? It's like when you have a sibling, you can hit your sibling or like shout at them as much as you want. But when someone else shouts at your sibling, you're like, hey, that's my brother. Or, you know, like, why are you doing that? And it's just kind of this weird psychological thing that you, that you have where it's like, you know, I mean, the best example that I can think of is the N-word, right? Um, you know, anyone who's not black can't use it, but then all black artists seem to use it in their rap songs, right? So, um, you know, how do you, where do you draw that line uh, amongst what's considered okay for me to do and my group to do and what's con not considered okay? So I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, I think that's kind of how I approached it. Yeah, I, Miriam, I'll just continue what um, Ahmed started saying. I, I feel that there's also like in the skit, they're talking about things that are connected both to Jewish people, like the, the intersection between Jewish people and society. It's issues that come out of the meeting between these two segments. And I think that making humor out of that, that's okay, because it's something that's connected to us dealing with the fact that Jewish people, we are part of society, but obviously we bring complications into the room because we're also a people, right? There's also a segregation there between the inner group and the outer group. And I think that that, that continues what Ahmed was just saying, right? Um, how, if it's something that's just about my religion, if it's something that is one of those nuances that's a little bit touchy, I, I won't feel as comfortable if somebody else is just laughing at that. But if it's, if it's something that's between us, that is hard because I'm a religious person living in a secular society, then I think that's already a place where um, it's okay for us to laugh about it together because this is content that we're sharing as a larger society um, is how I make those uh, differentiations. Right. I also wanted in this, connect, in this connection, I wanted to uh, look at another segment that we have prepared, um, taken from the Tracy Ullman show, uh, which is a British sketch comedy series starring Tracy Ullman that premiered on BBC One in 2016. While my time in America isn't directly relevant, I think it gives me an extra layer of experience to draw on. Absolutely, that's very impressive. I hope I'm not blowing my own trumpet too much here. If I had a trumpet this good, I'd be blowing it non-stop. Look, I think we're done here, so... I mean, obviously, I can't say anything official right now, but you should expect a phone call. Thank you. I just find it so difficult to boast on my CV. It's just that, as a Christian, I... Oh. What? <laughs> You're a... Christian. Yeah, okay. Uh, is that a... No, not at all. Y you don't seem to mention it anywhere here. Well, why would I? No, fair point. I'm not planning to run your polymer factory along biblical lines. <laughs> no. Could you just give me a second, please? <laughs> Denise, may I borrow you for a second? I'm just interviewing Patricia Hughes here. Oh, Patricia. How wonderful to meet you. Do you know, we're all so excited that you've applied for this role. It's really very flattering when somebody of your count. Oh. Yeah. Okay. There's a problem with me being a Christian, isn't there? Absolutely not, legally speaking. But you both <laughs> seem uncomfortable for some reason. Uh, do you think that it makes me untrustworthy? No. <laughs> Incompetent? Mm -mm. 
A bit weird? <laughs> I see. Well, in that case, I'll just withdraw my application. Oh, now. It's funny, isn't it? It's been perfectly normal to be a Christian in this country for the last 1,500 years or so. But now, well... I'm really sorry about this. It's fine. I forgive you. <laughs> Lucky escape. Yeah, what a nutter. <laughs> So this uh, the segment really sh sort of throws up quite a lot of questions. Is the joke here on the religious person or on the, the obviously secular people uh, dismissing her? Um, how how can we actually sort of explore majority minority uh, uh, relations through this? I mean, obviously, if uh, there was like an exchange and the person would say, "I'm a Jewish uh, of Jewish faith or of Muslim faith," the dynamics would be very very different. So. Um, what do you think uh, this, this, this segment is, is trying to say about the connection between religious and non-religious people? Alisa? Um, yeah, I think, first of all, I, I find this segment to be very offensive as a religious person. Um, I, don't, I don't understand how it was aired on BBC. Um, because it's obvious to me that if the joke was about a Muslim person or a Jewish person, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be perceived as okay. And it's perceived as okay because the Christian ambivalent majority is is the one that is that is being ridiculed. Um, but then the question is, who is the joke really about, right? So if you're like a, if you're a critical thinker type of viewer, then obviously you can tell that that the joke isn't about uh, that woman. The joke is about uh, the two bosses, and I think that she brings a lot of tension into that room when she says. Um, you know, this has been the majority for 1500 years. Christianity has been, everybody's been Christian. This new thing called secularism, you guys are the new ones. <laughs> um, and I think that, that, that there's a lot of content there about how much secular people, when they meet the religious, suddenly they're very pompous. Suddenly they're like, oh, these old <laughs> archaic beliefs, right? How are we still dealing with them? Um, and for me, the really powerful way that she says in the end, I forgive you, I think that that is, that is the way of, of, I think, to show that there is still so much truth in these beliefs. There is still so much, um, not only politeness, but it's just, it, it's, it's a way of life that, that you can really learn from. Um, and, and so in the end, I, I obviously, I think the joke is on the two interviewers that are, that are perceived as like really, just really dumb. Like here is a very good candidate to do a very good job and you're just being, um, yeah, you're just being dis you're you're discriminating her because of because of religious belief and 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 they say legally speaking, right? Obviously, in a situation like that, she she could sue them and and that would be the end. Um, but but I definitely think that um, for me, watching this segment, it, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because while I agree that the joke is being reversed and that we can think about the content that is being um, presented to us in this segment, I I don't I don't enjoy watching it just because I think that it's. It's not, it's not, something not good is happening on screen. And, and I'm not sure I, I connect to that specific form of, of humor. But of course, it, it sort of depicts a reality that is quite common for a lot of religious people. I mean, you know, going back to this uh, old saying, you know, we don't do God in Britain. Um, this is, of course, a stereotype that is faced by a lot of uh, religious people. Ahmed, what do you think about the, the segment? Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with what Alyssa said. I think there is this nuance where... Um, on the one hand, it's it's assumed that you know religious people, people of faith, are very close-minded. You know, they're they're very um, you know uh, strict in their views. Uh, but I think what this skit, in my opinion, is subtly trying to say is that you know secular people can be just as close-minded, and they're just as you know strict in their views about you know what they think of people of faith. And there is this there is this trend. I feel it definitely in the sciences where if you are somebody of faith, it's kind of almost like a quirk. It's like a weird thing. It's an unusual thing. Uh, it's like, wait, but you don't really believe in God, do you? Uh, and it's just this, you know, uh, you see a lot of that and you see a lot of, you know, there's this, it, it brings me to this debate that Raz Aslan had with this very famous physicist. Um, and I forget his name, but the interview goes as follows. He says to Raza, you know, Raza, you're a very good debater. And I think even you know that your views are ridiculous, but to save face, you will continue to sort of, you know, uh, defend your position. 
And I think that's the general view that there is in society and in, in especially in, in the sciences. So I think in, in this sense, what Alyssa also said that I agree with is that the critical thinker would view this, which then raises the question that is everyone a critical thinker? And then what is the mass effect that this skit will have? If someone's very critical, is a critical thinker and can understand the nuance of the skit, then they'll be like, right, I get this. This is about secular people being closed minded, or this is about, you know, Christian people being discriminated against. But somebody who's not well, might think something else, might not fully get the gist of what this is about. And, and, and yeah, there is a sense of, feeling a little bit like is this really funny do i find it funny i don't know if i find it funny it definitely does point out a reality but is it is it humorous um that that's a different question i think we've had a comment from uh, one of our viewers who says um alisa this is simply a reversal of the decades of experience of jews interviewing for jobs it's not about religious faith but the inversion of the real situation um and i think um sort of moving on this time, but I think we would be remiss to have this um, this discussion about humor and religion if we didn't really also discuss um, humor of religious themes and of religious figures. I mean, we have discussed the life of Brian in the series. We've discussed a number of other um, series that have religious figures as a, uh, as a center. Um, we have all heard about the discussions about the Muhammad caricatures, the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, affair. Um, we've all seen anti-capitalist cartoons, which show fundamentally anti-Semitic tropes and stereotype. So my question to the two of you is, where do you feel are the boundaries of what can be laughed at? Um, what differentiates a, a joke about religion that is really funny and leg legitimate uh, from something that is really sort of off boundaries um, within your two faith traditions? Alisa, do you want to start? Sure. So um, that's that's a good question. What are the boundaries? And and throughout the series, throughout Shtick, I was trying to to think about the boundaries both for a religious person and the boundaries for a secular person. So I think I think what's what's interesting about about everything that we've watched. Um, so it was Life of Brian. It was the Jews are coming. Um, is that these are created by secular people about religious audiences. Um, and, and a lot of religious people perceive this as out of the boundaries. That's why we had so many demonstrations and so many um, people writing op-eds at how upsetting these series are or the movies, right? A lot of the content that we watched on Shtick had a lot of criticism because the religious people perceived it as outside of the boundary. You can't make fun of my religion. But then when you tuned in more into the series or into the movie, as we did um, uh, during Shtick, you actually found that they were, they were having a really interesting discussion with the contents of the religion, uh, with, the, with, the, with the bedrock of what this religion believes in. And I think that in the end, it, it wasn't a secular kind of way of making fun of the religion. It was actually um, an intrigue coming from a secular viewer. And so for me, when I think about what are the boundaries between um, what you can make a joke about with Judaism and what you can't, it's, the question is, why are you having this discussion with this religion? Or why are you making the joke? Are you making the joke because you're interested in the conversation that this religion brings in? So if we're talking about, um, for example, the Jews are coming, they make a skit about different segments inside of the Torah, right? So inside, of the, inside of the religious text of the Jews. And they're portraying Abraham in certain way and they're portraying Moses in certain ways. And you can look at that and be like, that's really offensive. Like this is, these are people I believe in. These are people I, I pray about every single day. But you could also listen to what they're bringing between the lines and realize that they're, they're creating a very interesting and rich discourse and narrative with the religion, with, with the content that this religion produces. And if that is the aim, then I think as a Jewish person, I'm not speaking for behalf of all the Jews, right? I'm saying, from my standpoint, then that is a rich conversation and that, that is rich humor. And that would be within the boundaries of what I think is legitimate to laugh at. If the joke, however, is empty, it has no content, um, and it's just making fun of the shell of the religion. And often we can tell these kinds of jokes because they'll use things that are offensive. So they'll use sexual humor, they'll use bad language, bad mouthing, 
if that's the content that is brought on, then that for me is outside of the boundary. And, and it would be outside for almost anybody. I wouldn't want to see, I don't like seeing jokes like that being made about any minority group. And, and I don't enjoy it when it's made about the majority group because I just, I don't, I don't enjoy using that kind of humor, um, uh, that kind of satire. So I think that's the way for me to, 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 to differentiate between what I see as um, as appropriate and, and within the boundaries of, of what, what can be considered good humor, good satire that is using or that is uh, having a conversation with Judaism um, versus things that I find to be more offensive. Um, and it's just, and often the interesting thing is, is that um, my co-religionists, so other Jewish people might not agree with me and they will perceive um, um, the Jews are coming or they will perceive Yid life crisis as as um, as offensive, um, but then I think the question really is 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 what is the content that is brought into the conversation? And if there's content there, then it's okay to criticize using humor, and it's okay to have rich discourse and to disagree using humor. But if it's just the shell, if it's just using you know the Jew with the <laughs> with the dreadlocks and the thing and making a sexual joke, then then that's already and it's just the shell of the religion. You're just using it. Um, that's for me where I draw the line. Ahmed? Yeah, no, I mean, I very much agree with that analysis is very well put the, the content versus the shell, I, the kind of difference between the humor. And I agree with that. I think, um, you know, thinking about humor and what it's used for, uh, humor is used to tell a story. It's used to help other people understand and your own people understand some of the important questions that you have in a society or in a group of people. And uh, that's the best kind of humor. And honestly, that's the funniest kind of humor. Uh, but if you have the humor, that's simply just very, very shallow, very surface, um, you know, building on stereotypes that aren't necessarily true. Uh, that's the kind of humor that can be perceived as offensive. And I think those are the kinds of humor that need to be discussed um, in a little bit more detail and, and thought about, well, do we, what's the point of this joke? What is the, what are you trying to elicit out of people in this joke? What's your contribution with this joke? Um, but I would go a level further and say that there are certain types of humor and certain types of discourse where there is a feeling of, right, why is this person who isn't part of our group speaking about this? And this isn't just in one religious group. It's also within one, one gender within one religious group. So the example that I can think of is The Big Sick, the movie, about Kamel Nanjiani's life and how he met his wife, who's 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 white, and he talks about his whole experience from his perspective, and he talks about how, you know, his mom introduced him to all these other girls that were Muslim and that were uh, brown Pakistani, and he the way he portrayed those girls was in a very uh, unidimensional, flat way. It was you know these girls were all nerdy, didn't really they weren't really worldly, didn't really watch movies. And um, immediately there was a backlash by Muslim women saying, well, this is so offensive. You know, you're saying that all Muslim women aren't worldly. They don't watch TV. They don't watch movies. That's so wrong. You shouldn't be per perpetuating this kind of stereotype. And I think that had his, his, he did that, I think from his writing perspective, he probably didn't consider it primarily because he's a Muslim male. Um, but secondly, he, you know, from his perspective, he's probably going to say that, you know, I was just trying to make it so that the only possible outcome for me was this girl, this white girl that I married in the end. But in reality, uh, had he been a Muslim woman, one, he probably wouldn't have made the joke that way. And two, you know, he, it probably wouldn't have been perceived as offensive because he's within the group. So it's not only within the religious group, it's also, I feel like within the sub-religious groups in the religious group. Uh, so there is, there is that thing where, you know, when you're making a joke, what is the, what is the joke about? Who is it about? You know, in this scenario, the joke was about Muslim women. He's not in that group. Therefore, he, you know, he shouldn't be really making that joke. So I, I think that's kind of where I would draw the boundaries. You know, I know that's, that sounds hyper intellectualized, but you're like thinking, right, is this joke, who is this joke about? But I think it's needed, right? Because, uh, you know, as we know, humor sometimes creates rage. And I don't, I, I don't justify that rage. I don't think that you know, the way that people enact on that rage is acceptable in the Charlie Hebdo case, for example. But I do think that there needs to be consideration on how these jokes are created, who they're, who they're addressing and what, what kind of message that you're trying to bring to the people. We have now time for a few questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, so if you have a question, please type it now. 
Uh, we have a statement from Lina. Uh, hello, Lina. Uh, she writes, one issue with defining boundaries and determining what is permissible or acceptable humor is that the nature of humor itself is transgressive and pushing boundaries. So then the question becomes how elastic are or should humor's boundaries be? This is also where context comes in, so context, social setting, social, political context, and so on. And um, it's so important. Uh, the same joke might play out or be funny or not be funny in different contexts. Do you have any comment on this? Um, I have a comment on that. I think the, the idea of elasticity is very, very true. I think the same joke in, in one situation can be um, funny in, in, in scenario X and then in scenario one, Y, it could be just really inappropriate and offensive. Um, but I do think that we could always get a little bit trapped in this conversation of context. I think sometimes that becomes like a loophole where we, or a rabbit hole that we fall, we fall into. Um, when we say, well, you know, he was making this joke, but it was actually taken out of context because it really was okay. <laughs> we hear this a lot with politicians and the comments that they make. Um, and also within like interfaith circles and faith leaders that I've been part of, um, sometimes people make jokes and, and, and they perceive the context to be fitting. Um, but then when I reflected about that joke, or I reflected about the scenario, I was, I really, I just, I just thought that it, it just didn't matter <laughs> what the scenario was or how open we all are, or what a nice, it's just, there are certain things that may, maybe don't joke about them in that way. And so I agree with it, um, with what Lena is saying, but I also feel that sometimes um, there are there are certain boundaries that are very very hard, and it's very um, easy to notice them, and and it's not always very elastic. So I think like one of these things is when you when you make a picture of a Jew, a character of a Jew, and you're using again the dreadlocks and the money coins and whatever, everybody is going to think about anti-Semitic tropes there, right? It's going to be very good. Now I've seen for this this is actually a really good example. I've seen a comic strip which uses all of the anti-Semitic tropes. Uh, it's called Diaspora Boy, and it's making fun of like this, the relationship between diasporic Jewry and um, Zionists. But he's, util he's utilizing all of these symbols, these really hard symbols in the Jewish world to express what he thinks. Now you could say, oh, it's, 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 in this scenario, it's okay because the person who's making the comics is Jewish. He's talking about an inter-Jewish um, conversation and it's okay for him to use all the anti-Semitic tropes in his comics. But then if you think about it, then when he's using these anti-Semitic tropes in the comics, he's creating a situation where some of the Jews are considered not legitimate and some of the Jews are legitimate in his perception. And so in that, in that situation, in that satirical comics, it made me realize that no matter what or in which setting, you, in which setting we are, even if we're all Jewish in the room and even if it's an inter-Jewish and it's just satire and it's comics and whatever, Taking a, painting a Jew in a certain way is just, it's always going to take you to, to certain thoughts and certain memories and, and it's always going to be delegitimizing some person. Um, and so I agree with Lena, but I also think that sometimes it's just, it's not that elastic. Sometimes there are just things that you can't really touch in a cer certain way. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I think sort of working backwards with what Alyssa was saying about, you know, there's certain areas that you don't want to touch. And I think that has a lot to do with, there's certain areas where there's certain ways that you don't want to be portrayed. And um, I'll give you an example from, from Shia Islam. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of jokes made about self-flagellation, you know, uh, in Muharram and uh, people joke about that. And, but the thing is within the Shia community, joking about it is considered okay. But if it's outside the community, um, it's if, if, if a Shia is portrayed with someone who's like, you know, using swords on their back, that might be considered like a no-go zone primarily because Shias don't want to be portrayed in that way. They don't want to be, they want that to be a very private part of their religion and they don't want to be portrayed and identified in that light. And any jokes related to that might be considered out of bounds. Um, so that's definitely true. On the other hand, I think stretching comedy uh, and humor I associate that with stretching culture. And I think that that is incredibly important, especially when you think about certain societies. Um, you know, so if in Pakistan, there was a very famous movie done about the struggles of a uh, transgender boy. 
and the whole story and his sisters and how the dad disowns him and everything. And that was a very important issue because there is a, there's a large group of, um, you know, of, of transgender community in, in Lahore where I'm from. And that was a really critical movie. And there wasn't necessarily humor. There was some form of humor, but there wasn't necessarily humor, but I'm, I'm trying to allude to the fact that there are certain conversations that need to happen. And that does stretch culture. And I think in those situations, humor can also be used to stretch culture and talk about things that are quite difficult in that society. I would even say that talking, taking a humor approach would come first before taking on a very serious documentary series where you're talking about transgender rights in, in Lahore or in Pakistan. Whereas that same situation in another country, let's say the UK, would not be considered as controversial. And similarly, jokes in that scenario wouldn't be considered as controversial. So there is that there is that element. And I think I tend to view stretching humor as a positive thing, as long as the humor is stretched with a, with a direction that is well motivated and comes with a message, which is something that's important in society that needs to be discussed. You know, I often joke about, um, you know, people, you know, in in Muslim, in Muslim societies, you know, it's like the, the joke that I always talk about. I mean, I'm not saying I'm like a comedian or anything, but I'll always be like, you know, this is a typical Muslim, Muslim interaction. It's like, Oh, what mosque do you go? Like, Oh, well, are you Muslim? Yeah. Oh, oh, right. Are you this sect? Yeah. Cool. Is your mom Muslim? Yeah. Cool. You keep going down the list and you're like, Oh wait, do you drink water with your right hand or your left hand? Like left hand. It's like, Oh man, I can't be friends with you. I'm sorry. You know? So there's this thing where like, you know, there's this constant thing where everything has to match, but that's a real issue. And I think that's a real problem. And I think there's, although I joke about it, it's much deeper. I think, you know, there's this exclusion feeling that you have in the Muslim society that I feel needs to be talked about. And instead of saying, right, no, Muslims are so exclusionary. That's not, that's not going to have any movement. But when you talk about it in a humor approach and you portray it in that way, that makes people understand. They're like, oh yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And that creates discourse. And if you can keep stretching that, I think, the net effect is positive, but you always have those outlier edge cases, which are negative. And, you know, it's very difficult to set rules and boundaries that abide to all forms of jokes. You know, like there's some sort of rule book to say, Hey, if this joke about this, yes, no, why, et cetera. And you'll be able to say, yes, this joke is appropriate. It's very difficult to define those boundaries. And as a result, and, and as, uh, as Lena said, you know, that, that point is always stretching as well, that what those rules are always stretching as society goes forward, um, it's really difficult to say, you know, what's considered acceptable. Uh, but I do think that the net effect of humor, in my opinion, is positive because it does allow you to have conversations about things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about. All right, I think that's a very good last sentence because uh, we've actually come to the end of our time. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists very much for being with you. I would like to thank the audience for sticking with us and, um, do come to our other webinars of the Wolf Institute. Check out our webinars and other events on the uh, Wolf Institute website. Um, and uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>